So first keynote is uh, Professor Robert Aish. Uh, Robert Aish is a visiting professor of design computation at the Bartlett School of Architecture, UCL. His research explores how computational representations, language, and tools can improve the way architecture is conceptualized and delivered. Okay, so thank you very much, uh, Abel, and thank you for inviting me um, to give the first keynote, which is sort of uh, real honor since this is the first keynote of the first design computation conference and my uh, presentation is I hope uh, more of a reflection on how we've got to where we are now uh, and that other papers will uh, be looking uh, into the future but I think how we got here is really important um, so I'm going to start with my my uh, slides. Um, I've got, sorry, I've got to um, represent. So this is quite a more of a ref reflection on the use of representation. So it doesn't really matter what kind of algorithm or program you're using to um, in your design computation process. Eventually, this has to create some kind of representation, some media which uh, gives you insight into the workings of your algorithm. So representations, what, whatever your computational approach, representations as an intermediary between computation and the built environment is still really important. Um, so uh, I'm going to look at uh, three representations, drawings, BIM, and topology modeling. And the kind of human, not the, just the technical aspects, but the human issues involved in making the transition between these different representations. So starting with drawings, and our critique of drawing actually is somewhat biased or based on a comparison, a subsequent comparison with BIM. The, the problem with drawings as a, as a representation is that they don't 2D drawings, this is, is they don't really give you a complete representation. It's very difficult to make a complete representation of a 3D object. And if we have multiple drawings, they give us different views. And these drawings, in one sense, have the advantage of being independently editable. Uh, they can become inconsistent and they still rely on human intervention for interpretation. And so from a construction industry perspective, the consequences of these incomplete and inconsistent information is construction errors and increased construction costs. And I think it, it took a long time for the construction industry to work out that it wasn't just dealing with materials and processes, it was dealing with information. And if it's dealing with information, it's got to sort of like follow some of the rules about how information is created and transmitted and interpreted. And so really the weakness, if you like, in, in, in drawings, was part of the original argument back in the in the 1980s for BIM. Although in this presentation, I'm not just giving a, a simple advocacy of BIM, I'm going to be much more reflective. Um, and it's quite interesting at the same time that BIM was emerging, so was the automation of 2D drafting. And we could argue in retrospect that the existence of automated 2D drafting uh, really inhibited and deferred the adoption of BIM. So, years ago I was with Chuck Eastman at Georgia Tech and he pulled out the first uh, BIM handbook, uh, November 2007, and pointed to the uh, introduction by Jerry Lazeron and very nicely told me that the people that I had written when I was working on RUCAPs at GMW Computers on building information modeling was in fact viewed as the first time that this, the phrase of building modeling or information modeling had been used. Um, and the, the paper that I'd written, which, and here it is, actually laid out all the uh, fun, uh, functional uh, um, aspects of BIM and their advantages. So um, this, this paper is referred to in, in the references. You can, you can follow it up. Um, but essentially, the RUCAS functionality, which is exactly the same as, as fundamental to BIM now, uh, is that you know, buildings are an assembly of components, and this acts as the defining data. Components could have multiple representations. Drawings are essentially 2D reports from this model, 
drawings cannot be edited. The building, the actual underlying model has to be edited as a transaction and all the defining um, and then all the reports rederived. The BIM database could be shared between multiple users, allowing real-time collaboration. Uh, the data was timestamped, therefore you could model a sequence, a building sequence, for example. And indeed, some of the components could be parametric defined by rules in BASIC. So it sounds, you know, you know, 40 years ago, it sounds very similar to what we've got at the moment. Here's just some um, uh, illustrations from that paper of, of, of 1986. You know, the, the door is has different representations, whether it's viewed in elevation or in plan or in perspective. We can do things like clash detection to do coordination between different uh, building subsystems. And when we edit the model, we are going to move the desk below to the over to the right. You know, all the views change. Um, of course, the graphics is very, is very simple, very crude, but basically the information system is exactly the same as BIM. And here, you know, British Library on uh, Euston Road is classic uh, building built with RUCAPs. And so going back to this, this uh, RUCAPs functionality, I'm struck by the first sentence, which is building models and assembly of components in 3D as defining data. Where did this idea come from? And in fact, it, it, the, the precursor is a paper by uh, Chuck Eastman in 1974. Um, uh, called the uh, where he outlines the building description system BDS and the key sentence in here is a building is considered as a spatial composition of a set of parts and really that that statement in 1974 is the foundation for our whole sort of BIM edifice at the moment and it makes a clear distinction between defining and derived data um, it deals with transactions and it reduces consistent data, reduces construction errors. The, but um, are also, dis, I think, uh, disadvantages of BIM, which we need to address. Okay, so not, though a building may end up as a spatial composition of a set of parts, this is not necessarily the way it needs to be conceptualized or represented. Um, and it puts the cart before the horse. It requires you to think about macro considerations of how the building will be decomposed into components before you've actually even got a building concept there, before you've dealt with the macro considerations. And though there's a valid need to switch from 2D drafting to BIM for construction accuracy and efficiency, I think unfortunately BIM has established a new orthodoxy in which there are a promotion of BIM as something which is architecture. You don't need anything more than BIM to do architecture. And I think this is this is something that you know, we need to reflect on. So, uh, BIM is a technology. It certainly is also a methodology. You need to understand how to use it correctly. It is not a philosophy of design. And if we look at the timeline, uh, you know we have. Um, RUCAP's you know, proto-BIM system in the mid 80s, uh, actually coming uh, more or less at the same time as the first release of AutoCAD 2D drafting. But what happens is, you know, nearly 10 years earlier is the Eastman, uh, Chuck Eastman's paper on the building's uh, design system. But essentially, uh, even my colleagues who were working with me on RUCAPs um, in the 1980s, you know, some of us realized that this was not the complete answer. And so to say, okay, there's a post-BIM challenge, you know, that challenge always existed, even back then, you know, we, we need to have um, a more explicit representation of architectural space, because however uh, interested we are in materials and making, and this is sort of one of the features of the of Bartlett, really wonderful feature of the Bartlett, that we have this, uh, emphasis on design for manufacture. Um, really, if we look at architecture in the whole, the intentions of form and space necessarily precede considerations of material and making. And yet, this is not. This needs to be helped along with a proper representation. It's not going it, to, you know, it, it's not going to come there by itself. And so, uh, the, 
the dissatisfaction with BIM uh, you know, prompted me to look at topology modeling as a new representation, which can be a response to this challenge. But in the same way that we go back to the timeline, you know, the BIM has taken multiple decades to, to get to adoption. The, um, the topology modeling has also taken multiple decades because we can start off, you know, in 1997 with a prototype that I built uh, at Bentley uh, and which was shown at a important conference organized by NASA in, in 1997. And I just want to take you through the slides of this presentation because I think they, they illustrate a lot of the important points. Okay, so we're going to take a simple cube and we're going to use the edges of that cube to support, to be the topological support for the material uh, component. This is a, a simple truss. We can add trusses to the, to the edges of, 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 the, of the cube. And then we can, we can zoom out and then we can uh, expand the cube. And We'll just hold it at this moment because you can now see that in topology modeling, there's a distinction between the idealized model, that's the white cube, and the material model, which is the yellow trusses. So when I change the idealized model, you know, the material model uh, recomputes. It's not as a scaling operation, it's recomputing, it's measuring the length of the edges, it's computing how many bays it needs to have in the truss. And so we have the idea of change propagation between the two models. And then when we add in another component, like a, a column, to one of the vertical edges, we see that the, the trusses uh, adapt to that, you know, as I added in. And what we're seeing here is the connectivity between the material model and the mutual response of the elements in the material model use topology, the topology of the idealized model, as the communication channel. And that's the really important thing. We can see them moving backwards and forwards. And if we zoom in again, just because we're using topology doesn't mean to say that we can't do things like direct manipulation. Uh, so you know, that we can combine computational modeling, topology, and direct manipulation modeling in the same application. And then we can change things like level of detail, uh, you know, add in the, the kind of um, webs and nuts and bolts, you know, and um, add, you know, sort of, we can get to our, our structural coffee table. But this is just using manifold. Uh, topology. We wind forward, you know, uh, you know, 15 years or so, and at this stage uh, we looked at um, the use of non-manifold cellular modeling. So we start off again with a, a, a cube. We can make it a bit more interesting by trimming off the face, and that's that's a that's a manifold um, a topology. It's got an inside and an outside. And, and a simple uh, manifold skin between the two. But now we're going to divide it up as we would do with a real building, because buildings aren't just one room. And now we have a non-manifold uh, topology because we've got internal faces representing the, in the spatial partitioning of, of, the of, the, of the sort of proto building. And now we can decorate the edges with different components and those components depend on how many whether they're inside or outside we know whether they're inside or outside because of the number of faces that meet at a particular edge and now we can um you know switch off the, the display of the faces and we can come along with something like an atrium or a core and we can pass it through the the building and every time i'm clicking this forward i'm not going around with my cursor identifying a particular edge and say, oh, can you make that into a particular kind of I-beam? No, no, no. The, the whole basis of this is that the a relationship between the idealized model and the material model is, is, is a, a rule-based system, a computational based system, so that I can you know, pass this through amoeba-like. And we can now see that exactly the same rules are happening, that there's this association between the um, a topological idealized model and the material model, and there's a change propagation. And because there's change propagation, I don't have to worry. I can make changes. I don't have the hard work of going back in the in the BIM model and manually changing the model. This is all automated for me. This is a tremendous freedom. So next stage happened more recently where we not only used non-manifold model, but we also used mixed dimensional uh, topology. And this opened up an, a new kind of possibility. Here we have um, the, the, the cellular model, 
And now we can create a dual graph which links the vertices, the links the centroids of these um, spaces, uh, which gives us one kind of analysis. But then we can do a much more sophisticated analysis where the green spheres are the centroids, the red spheres are the external faces, and the blue spheres are representing shared faces between adjacent um, spaces. And this is exactly the data structure needed for energy analysis because we need to know the volume of the room, we need to know which uh, walls are external, which walls are internal, and what's the temperature on the other side of the internal wall. But also we can add in um, openings into the internal faces so that we can create a circulation route. Um, so this one topological model provides us with a number of analytical models for uh, energy analysis or circulation. Uh, and then the mixed um, topology means that we can now start modeling things in a more realis realistic way. We can have edge-based components for columns, slab uh, face-based components for slabs, uh, um, three-dimensional cell-based components for, for cores. And uh, actually, we retrospectively found that this idea of mixed-dimensional topology um, had been referenced by Bill Mitchell and uh, Malcolm McCotton uh, in 1994, and we actually reproduced their example in, in Topologic. And, you know, if you want a realistic uh, building example, you know, just look at the Senate uh, by Richard Rogers in Cardiff, you know, how you could not represent that building without mixed dimensional topology. Um, so, uh, essentially, um, let me just move this out of the way. Uh, um, it's a conceptual of a uh, model of architecture, which doesn't need the user to predefine the decomposition of the building into components, which is required by BIM. And the, you know, it, it makes it very much more easy to, to represent the enclosure and partitioning of space. We can create these different analytical models and we can have uh, material models and essentially the ease with which we can um, the minimum information, the ease with which we can modify this model really reduces the cost of change and therefore encourages design exploration. So looking at another example of, of a manufacturing point of view, this is a facade that I worked on with Bureau Happel facades, um, where the whole detailing and construction is based on topology. So here we have one face and we have another face. We can then find out the shared edge between that face we can find out the uh, uh, face normals. And using that, we can construct a bisector for the shared edge. And that, of course, is the basis for all the um, construction of this model. So we now change that model or change the construction. It, it all uh, propagates through. And um, what is interesting, that this has a sort of backdrop to history because this facade is on the Black Lives Matter Plaza in Washington, uh, DC. Um, we have this uh, progression from the 2D uh, drawing era to the BIM era, uh, where drawings are essentially derived from the 3D model, to the design computation era, where we can either have a script driving um, BIM, or we can actually have a script driving a spatial model. So if we have the spatial model, we can have two routes to the building, through generating BIM, through generating drawings, and then generating the building, or generating a fabrication model and directly generating the building <clears throat> in, in that way. So here's the timeline which we had for BIM. If we overlay the timeline for topology modeling, you can see also that it's a multi-decade project and we still haven't got to really any serious adoption. And it's one of the reflections that, you know, the construction industry seems to be like one generation out of sync, you know, 180 degrees out of sync with what's the technology that's available. And if we think about the, the different representations, we have to go back and, and recognize, I think, that architecture is a hybrid activity. It sort of combines what is objective and what is subjective, what is logical, what is intuitive, analysis, imagination, you know, imagination saying, well, what could I do? And the analysis is saying, but what would actually happen if we did that? And you know, it's very spontaneous, but the objective persona is saying, yes, but I need to think about this. I need some premeditation here. 
So we're dealing with something which is, could be apparent and persuasive or something which is fundamental and consequential. And I was listening to one of my colleagues who was using design computation for the first time. And he came up with this really very positive remark, which was the advantage of your system is that it enables me to think about what I'm doing. And that was all pretty positive. Then there was a slight pause. And then he came back and said, the disadvantage of your system is that it forces me to think about what I'm doing. And I think that, that this, is, this captures in one person this sort of duality. And the question is, is this duality in conflict or how can we resolve it so it all works together that both, both can contribute to architecture? So the question is, if architecture is hybrid, are the representations also hybrid? And I would suggest that uh, drawings are a really convenient representation of design and intuition, but really awkward for design logic because they don't have that coherent information model. Whereas BIM is very convenient, particularly for construction logic, but really difficult to deal with um, design intuition. And you know, my proposal is that you know, topology modeling is a representation which is equally suitable for intuition and logic. And um, really, it's, the modeling is intuitive and the logic, you know, the deep structure comes for free. It just sort of drops out. If you model it with these tools, you will get all the opportunities to do topological queries and to build intelligent models uh, downstream. So of course, we want to look at the transitions and the transitions from drawing to BIM are really something which required uh, a industry-wide process re uh, re-engineering and it gives very much collective benefits. I think the transition from BIM to topology modeling is much requires sort of individual cognitive retooling. If I can use the phrase of Ulrich Fleming from CMU, which I think is sort of summarizes this. And it gives, of course, individual advantage. You don't have to wait for the old next door neighbor to be doing it for you to take advantage of it. But of course, there is aggregated benefits as well. So each of these transitions can be viewed as being disruptive or an opportunity uh, for individual industry advancement. Uh, but essentially, all these transitions, like why do I, why did I stay with what I've got, or shall I go and explore something which is a bit new? It really depends on a trade-off between immediate but limited and, and sort of known benefits and deferred but rather unknown but potentially substantial benefits. And this kind of um, behavioral economic model, you know, has some precedence. Um, this is a recognized pattern because in the 1970s at Stanford, there was a psychological experiment conducted with, um, you know, junior school um, students who were presented with the, with the choice, you know, have one marshmallow now or two later. And, you know, in our case, you know, you've got to do a bit of cognitive retooling to get the two marshmallows. But it's really quite sort of ironic, if you like, that the, the behavior of the construction industry in the, in the, in the transition of representations uh, is very similar to our junior school students and their Stanford marshmallow test. So your choice, one marshmallow now or two marshmallows later. So um, thank you. Uh, for the opportunity to give uh, the keynote. Thank you.